This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Welcome to Is Beer in Your Career? Uh, what are the career opportunities in San Diego's burgeoning brewing industry? Welcome. My name is Henry DeVries. I'm the Assistant Dean for Continuing Education at the University of California, San Diego. And we're hosting and televising the panel today. Uh, we're really looking to help job seekers today. What will job seekers learn? They're going to get answers from a panel of experts that we've assembled here. Uh, they're going to converse about why San Diego has become such a nationally renowned region for the craft brewing industry. So we want to hear about that and what opportunities that opens up. Uh, the panel discussion is being captured for broadcast by UCTV Career Channel. And it's part of our opening here of the San Diego History Center's exhibit, Bottled and Kegged, San Diego's Craft Brew Culture, uh, which explores the ebb and flow of the beer industry here in San Diego. Uh, the exhibit features many hands-on interactive elements, and it really helps explain what's happening with the brewing process, how San Diego County be, uh, became this mecca for brewing. And uh, we also look at uh, what is the science behind matching beers with food. Actually, we'll have some art and science that we'll be talking about today. So let's meet our panel. Uh, first up is uh, Tommy Arthur. He's the co-founder and director of brewery, brewery operations, that's easy to say. Absolutely. Uh, yes, for Port Brewing and the Lost Abbey, located in San Marcos. So Tommy, why don't you start us off. Uh, what's a good entry level job for someone who wants to get started in the brewing industry? We, um, we, we get that request a lot. I, I think that might be the single most uh, requested thing on our website is how can, I, how can I get my foot in the door into the brewing industry these days. And um, it used to be that you would hang out at the bar or the brewery that you were closest to and you would sort of beg, plead, and at some point they would hire you to come on board. And uh, now that the business of beer has gotten so big, it's getting very difficult uh, to get your proverbial foot in the door that way. So uh, a lot of people are looking to schools and uh, technical you know, proficiency is becoming a big thing. It used to be if I was a home brewer, I, I might be able to just find a brewery I liked and could easily get my foot in the door. Um, my story is not in, that indifferent. I, I was a home brewer, and I uh, answered an ad in the paper for an assistant brewing position, and uh, that sort of started my career. These days, most entry-level brewing jobs involve um, what we call chucking glass, picking up kegs, cleaning kegs, sweeping the floor, um, basically being part of the packaging crew, and uh, it's a good place to start. Okay. Well, next up is uh, Yusuf Cherney. He's the head brewer and co-founder of Ballast Point Brewing Company, one of San Diego's top breweries. So Yusuf, uh, how long would it take a motivated individual to go from entry level to brewmaster? Well, that's about the hardest question you could probably uh, <laughs> ask. Years, yeah, yeah, it, it yeah. can be anywhere from... Uh, Yusuf's mm -hmm. still working on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's uh, hard to take stuff like that from uh, Greg, you know. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it, it, it really depends on um, what the person's motivation is and the passion level that they have. I think one of the classic stories, and he'll, he'll probably kill me for bringing him up, but James, he's our lead brewer right now. And he came in uh, as a guy from New York City, a little kid, 20 years old, and he was looking for a job. He, he became our keg washer, and he'd show up 10 minutes early every day. He'd stay till the job was done. And... Uh, we had an opening for a brewer in just uh, several months, and he hopped up that ladder so quick, and it was just his his uh, passion for the craft that, that really did it and dedication to getting the job done. So there's a lot uh, to it as far as, you know, being being totally dedicated to, to your position. And uh, not there isn't obviously a huge uh, paycheck, unless you're Greg. Uh, in the in the <laughs> brewing industry, so it's it uh, it is basically you know gonna 
going to boil down to uh, your love for beer. And, and I think a lot of people in this room have that. So, uh, you know, it might, might be a little bit easier. It, it is a very hard field to break into because there's so many people stupid enough to uh, want to work for nothing, you know? So to get into this kind of industry and uh, work your way up from, from a ground level position um, is, is quite difficult, especially now. But the nice thing is, is there's 70 breweries, close to 70 breweries now in San Diego, and the job market is there. You know, there are quite a, quite a few positions. We've gone to around 70 plus employees uh, this year. And uh, when, when I started, you know, it was just me and Jack. Uh, we were the only two guys. So definitely, in, even in this last year, you know, adding 30 or 40 people is uh, a crazy boom to the industry. So passion is the main thing and dedication and then uh, and knowledge, um, which is hopefully going to be what UCSD helps uh, provide to the San Diego brewing industry. Okay. Well, now let's meet uh, our next panelist, Greg Cook. Since co-founding Stone Brewing Company with his partner Steve Wagner in 1996, Stone has become one of the fastest growing and highest rated breweries in the world. So Greg, do you see the industry here in San Diego being as promising in, in the next five years as it's been in the past five? Um, I, it certainly has that potential. We've set the stage for it mutually. Uh, it, it really does depend on us. Uh, I think a lot of us in the brewing industry today, looking at the current uh, boom of new entrants, are both uh, excited and, and maybe just a little bit uh, cautious. Um, we're, we're hoping that, that the, the new entrants into the brewing industry uh, are uh, as, as careful and methodical uh, as they should be when introducing their beers and about their, their beer quality and their beer stability and so on. Um, but as long as we uh, maintain that and, and mutually keep the high standard that we've set for ourselves, there's no question that we will continue to go on and, and, and uh, maintain the level of prominence that we have. And, and frankly, it, just as, as a point of reference, if you ask anybody in the world, where an average person in the world, where the great brewing center today is, what will they tell you? I think they'll tell you Germany. Germany's been on decline for 30 years. It's, it's, it's a, and I'll say this in Germany to Germans, they will admit that themselves. It's the, the U.S. scene is vibrant and alive and creative. And so in San Diego, we have the opportunity to either lock this in, lock in our reputation, and have a reputation that lasts for decades and decades, or we can give it up to somebody else by stumbling a little bit. So I, I, I want to make sure that you know, mutually I think it's in our best interest we don't stumble and help each other along the way and, and make sure that we maintain this really great foundation we have. Okay. Well, now let's meet our scientist on the panel, Chris White. White Labs Incorporated, Pure Yeast and Fermentation, was founded by UC San Diego alumnus Chris White back in 1995. So. Chris, does a degree in chemistry or any other science field help in this field? Well, I think it does help. Uh, there's not that many, um, and there's not that many laboratory jobs in the industry yet. A lot of the breweries are small. They're getting bigger, and as they get bigger, they put in laboratories. And most of the brewers I meet are um, a little bit more in the liberal arts area, well-educated, uh, but less scientific and it used to be different i mean the coors family trained all their kids to be engineers or made sure they were engineers because if you were going to run the brewery in the next generation you needed to be an engineer and while that's still helpful uh things are changing so craft brewers um are uh, more artistic and you can see that with the different types of beer and the breadth of beer styles and the packaging but the best ones still have a firm grasp of science. So they either had a good uh, amount of science in college and high school or have had an interest in it. And you also meet people with PhDs in biochemistry and chemistry um, as brewmasters. So the more you know about science, uh, the more you understand about beer because that's what really um, um, made me interested in beer besides enjoying the flavor was that there was so much chemistry and biochemistry in the production of beer. You take, you know, grain, turns into uh, 
uh, liquid uh, with alcohol and flavor compounds in it through the process of yeast fermentation. So the more you know about that, the more you understand the brewing process. And um, it's just in the craft brewing industry, I think it's a bit of a combination of being well-rounded, you know, having the scientific background and artistic uh, and uh, whatever else that is in the liberal arts field with um, world politics and, and everything else because you have to also create names for your beers and understand where your beers are in position to other beers and you need to know marketing and you need to all, know all sorts of things because these are small companies. Okay. Well, let's talk uh, dollars and cents. Can, I, can I just, oh, I'd no. like to jump sure. in with a quick comment if okay. I could about, yeah. about brewing jobs. Okay. And I, I want to stress the fact that, and I think all these guys would ag agree, um, it's about, uh, it's not rocket science, it's about showing up on time. It's about day in, day out dedication and passion. It's about uh, really just being the kind of person that you look at the job that they do every day and you say, this guy or this gal, they're mastering it. They're the person I would pick for the next step. And a lot of times, I think when I get asked the questions, you know, how do I become a brewer? How do I become a whatever? It's you go in, and there's no mystery to this. You go in, you work harder than average. You do a great job and you watch every step because that's critical in the brewing process of watching every step. And you be the kind of person that any one of us would want to depend on and would want to leave a particular duty to um, and, and trust in doing it. That's how you do it. And it's no different than almost any other kind of job. I, I want to jump on that real quick. Okay. We, we have at the Lost Abbey a lot of religious sort of uh, overtures in terms of our things. And we have a Ten Commandments. And one of our Ten Commandments is, is that you can't buy passion at the corner store. And that, that's it. I mean, we, we look for those passionate individuals, people that bring that joie de vivre to the table. Now, it doesn't mean you can bring that to the table and be an idiot because you can be very passionate and be very, very, you very can. not good at your job. But, and, and clearly that exists in the world. But people that bring an energy more often than not are going to excel. And that's an exciting thing. So energy is a big part of it. Tommy, I want to get back to money. What are the salaries oh, that you get? Money. Oh, okay. It's all about money. All right. What, it's uh, all about money, yeah. Yeah, that's I know. It's the, an art. It's an art. But what can people earn in this industry? Um, you can earn a lifetime of respect. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, um, that being said, all of us sitting on this table, in fact, I wanted to bring this point up. All of us broke into this scene in San, in San Diego in, you know, in the, in the mid-90s. So we've all been at it quite a while. Um, you know, you can make money in this industry, but if you get in this industry to make money, you're probably getting in it for the wrong reason. So um, I, I joked earlier that an entry-level job in the brewing community pays less than in and out does, so you're probably better to go flip hamburgers than you are to, to chuck kegs. Um, but long-term, you can make money in the beer industry, and you can be passionate, and you can have a great lifestyle. This is a lifestyle industry. People come to us every day and say, I would love to be a part of what it is you guys do. You look like you're having a lot of fun. That's great, but fun doesn't pay the bills. So somewhere between getting up every day for work and taking three extra growlers home with you is what you make. And um, that won't pay the bills. And certainly when the government takes more than, more than they used to away from you, that makes it difficult as well. So uh, can you do it? Sure. Um, my first brewing job paid me $6.35 an hour. Um, that was in 1996. And I clearly make a little bit more than that today or I wouldn't be sitting here talking about beer. So, Yeah, I could go. jump in that and, yeah. hmm, and also say uh, it's pretty cool to say I make beer for a living. Uh, it, uh, when you're in a, a group of people and, and talking to folks that say, you know, I'm a doctor or a lawyer, which is of course what my, my family had, uh, had <laughs> planned for me. Um, you know, to say that, that you do make beer for a living, uh, and then they start asking you about it and all of a sudden you, they, you start realizing that, Hey, uh, my job's pretty cool. And those people are pretty bummed out at what they do. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this is about as dressed up as I get. Usually uh, shorts and a T-shirt or more uh, and a pair of boots would be the, the typical outfit in a brewery. But, uh, yeah, it, it is definitely, when I, when I started out 21 years ago, uh, it was pretty much minimum wage, and uh, there, was no, there was no living to be had making, making beer. So uh, to work your way up the ladder is, is a thing that can be done now, um, whereas before you pretty much had to be an owner to uh, t to be able to make any kind of living at it. Now you can be a lead brewer, or a, a lab uh, quality analysis person, and be making a decent amount of money because there are breweries now in San Diego that are large enough um, where you don't have to go to a program and come out and work for Budweiser. You can go to work for, you know, Stone or 
a port, one of the port breweries or Dallas Point or something like that. And, you know, you don't have to live with five other people in an apartment. <laughs> and, uh, as, as the saying goes, I love this saying, uh, buy a man a beer, uh, waste an afternoon. Teach a man to brew, waste a lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> we are happily wasting our lives away doing this thing that we love so much. Well, let's talk about how people can get into that. Yeah, Yusuf, what about training to get into the industry? Well, it's uh, curious that you would mention that, uh, <laughs> being UCSD TV and all. But uh, UCSD is uh, on the cutting edge here of um, what what I've kind of had a little piece of for, for 20 years, and Chris White as well. Uh, Chris was one of my first um, students at the UCSD Craft Center, and uh, that was back in the day when we were teaching, I was teaching brewing to home brewers. We had a home brew shop. I taught home brewing and Chris became my brewing partner and we started messing around with yeast together. Uh, that was kind of the birth of uh, what I, you know, a lot of the home brewing in San Diego kind of developed out of, out of Home Brew Mart, which is the store that I worked for. Um, I believe that's one of the reasons why San Diego's got such a strong brewing community because of the home brewers and the yeast that Chris ended up making is uh, revolutionized the beer industry. Uh, but UCSD has uh, ha had the foresight to come up with a program that's going to mirror um, some of the better brewing schools, and notably UC Davis and Siebel, and give a uh, certificate brewmaster uh diploma essentially to uh, people that can graduate through the through the set of credited classes so what I've been in in charge of doing as the lead instructor is assembling kind of a, a dream team of, of people that can instruct brewers to uh, take to be able to go into the workforce and have some credentials and to have some knowledge of the industry and now that there are so many breweries and so many positions in San Diego that it, it does it will help people to have the that degree behind them uh if not just a few courses behind them because up till now um people have had to travel quite a ways and and be on lo long wait lists to get that we're also going to try to put together like the equivalent of the uh sommelier program for beer um to allow more of the layman uh the bar owners the pub owners to get in and really uh get a deeper understanding of what beer is all about so this is starting up at UCSD in the summertime. We've got several classes coming up, and uh, we've got, uh, of course, the people here, uh, Peter, that put it together. Um, it's it's going to be a, a kind of revolutionary thing, I think, for San Diego and San Diego's craft beer scene to to have people that not only have the passion but have the experience of some real veteran brewmasters to, uh, to learn from. Okay. Chris, I wanted to direct a question to you. Um, about positions in the industry that aren't in the brewery. What, what else is available for people? Well, that might be as large as the brewing industry. As the industry gets larger, there are more companies that are formed to supply them with malt and hops and yeast and glassware and all sorts of other things. And um, I was going to say earlier about money and, and jobs uh, in the brewing industry. All of our companies were built in, by employees who made less than they would elsewhere. So employees that were willing to make less money and work in the brewery and the hardworking ones, as was said earlier, rise. And you keep noticing them and they do get uh, good jobs and they do get good money. And then what I see a lot of times is those people within the breweries d go out, they stay in the brewing industry, but they go to one of the other companies and they might become a salesperson or a technical person in one of the companies that support the brewing industry and actually provide, in some cases, a longer standing career for that person if they've topped out at the small brewery they might be at. So there are lots of, uh, uh, you know, I guess just positions in this industry that you might not even think of besides the brewer position. Even within the brewery, there's lots of other positions, right, that support the brewery from packaging and cellaring and uh, marketing and uh, uh, finance uh, to the companies that support the brewing industry. And when I started, there were very few companies that actually supported the small brewing industry. They were larger companies who did other things and maybe sold a little bit of ingredients into the brewing in craft brewing industry. But now, these other companies are noticing what's happening with small breweries. Well, there's a lot of small breweries now. 
right? So there's more market for them. So a lot of other companies that have sort of ignored this industry for a long time are coming in, and those are providing more jobs and opportunities for people within the brewing industry to go to those companies. Hey, so Greg, I'd like to direct it to you. Um, what do you see as the logical conclusion here? Are there going to be more and more and more breweries, or are we looking at an industry that might consolidate in the future, and how would that affect careers? Uh, that's, that's a great question. Uh, th this, uh, craft brewing is definitely about the, the journey, not the destination. There's no question about that. So all of the, the passion and then the individual toils that we've gone through and so on, it's about the, the, the lifestyle choice that we've made, of course. As the number of breweries uh, grows, we're somewhere in the 65 range here in San Diego County now. There's uh, uh, rumored to be in the close to 100 by the end of this year. But they're all over the range in size. Some of these guys are, are quite small. They're more than happy to be quite small. They're not doing it as a, an income producing uh, move. They're doing it as a passion move. They want to brew a little bit and share it legitimately uh, you know, with friends and maybe at their local bar. In order to do that, they have to be licensed. In order, and if they're licensed, that means they're a brewery. They're an operating brewery. Um, at some point, uh, th with the ebb and flow, because there's always an ebb and flow, right? Uh, um, yes. There's always a bump in the road. There's nothing that's been in the history of mankind or our civilization or certainly not our industrialized area that hasn't been cyclical to some level. And we opened up, uh, all opened up in 95, 96 range when in 96 was the first bubble in the craft brewing industry and, it, and the scene changed dramatically, practically overnight. Uh, and just now the past few years we've been on this tear and I think we could uh, reasonably call it the an age of irrational exuberance. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, you know, I am enormously positive, bullish and happy and thrilled about all these uh, great breweries that are opening up. And, and those of you know, we, we serve them on tap at our own restaurant, just like the, the pizza ports do. Um, but there's gonna be, there's gonna be a change that we won't see coming that's the nature of life. Um, as they say, life is what happens while you're making other plans. So life will happen. I'm not sure exactly what it'll look like, but it won't be on this linear scale or linear uh, direction that we're on now. Just, just not the nature of it. So, um, you know, batten down the hatches, not because there's a storm, but because it's the right thing to do for your business. Make sure your, your, your ship is in shape. And that you've, you've got, uh, you know, all of your, your mechanics working and such so that when it, and if a storm or hell, a calm comes, you're prepared for it properly. Okay. Oh, good. Well, Yusef, how about a question like this? Uh, what advice do you give to job seekers who are trying to bridge their career into the industry? Yeah, another, another <laughs> tough one there. <laughs> uh, tough another one, doozy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the the funny thing is with the start of the craft, the smaller craft guys in, in the industry just recently, there's been a lot of uh, nano breweries opening up, which is funny because, uh, you know, when we started brewing, we, we were brewing on about a two barrel system that I built. So you were I, nano I'm, before nano yeah, I'm was not, cool. I, I guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Uh, nano wasn't a word back then. So, um, but yeah, a lot of the a lot of the pharmaceutical companies in San Diego are are kind of going out of business, and those folks that are in that industry are are geared to the same concepts, you know, the the yeast propagation and the cleanliness and everything. So those people tend to have a natural knack for going into the brewing industry, and that's what's happened. A lot of the craft little tiny craft spots are ex pharma plant folks, so that's a way to bridge, you know, you, you have the experience already and you can just go from, uh, making, uh, com you know, compounds in a lab to making, making beer. Um, but the best way to start and how most of us did, uh, is home brewing and start making beer at home. That's, that's the number one thing to do. And that's why San Diego is what it is. Um, once you have a fundamental idea of, of the process, uh, and the cleanliness it takes to make the beer, then you can kind of make the next jump. Uh, as far as getting into a brewery, I think we've all said, you get into a brewery any way you can. If it's uh, hanging out there and kind of getting to know the folks that work there in the tasting room or you know, going to the smaller breweries and trying to get your foot in the door into a place that hasn't yet become the next big place. 
um, you know, there's, there's tiny little breweries here now. You might be able to get in there and, and maybe they're going to be the next ballast point. Um, that's something that, you know, that you could weasel your way into. There's a fine line between weaseling your way into the door and being <laughs> incredibly annoying. And yeah. uh, that's something that some people need to, uh, you know, tone back. <laughs> but, uh, you know, th- I stalkers? think... Stalkers? You have beer stalkers? Well, there, there's definitely people in the industry, you know, that, that want to get their foot in the door no matter what. But at the same time, you know, uh, if you're getting paid sixty, seventy thousand 70000 a year, um, the chances of walking away from that job and, and you know humping kegs off, off a kegging line uh, for 10 bucks an hour. It's, it's, it's one of those hard decisions in life. But some people are doing it. Some people are walking away from their jobs and going into the brewing industry because it's, it's what they really want to do. And it gets back to my point of, you know, going up and telling somebody that you make beer for a living. If, that, if that's something that really imp- impresses you and would, you would think would, uh, would be the choice for you, then... You know, you, you kind of have to make that decision. Is it the, is it the money or the lifestyle? And, and I, I gotta say, I've, I've traveled to a lot of different countries. I've, I've drank beer all over the world. And, uh, I don't think I would have had that opportunity had I, you know, been, uh, going to law school and, and, uh, as a anecdote, you know, we've, we won the world beer cup a couple years back, which is kind of the, uh, the biggest award you can win small beer manufacturer, um, gold medals and, and all. And, and that, at that point, my f- my dad did finally pat me on the back and said, "My son, the brewer." <laughs> yes. And yes. Uh, <laughs> before that, it had always been my son, the doctor. As I was growing up, you know, so it it, it might take uh, winning a gold medal to get the acknowledgement of your of your father, but uh, mm-hmm. you know, it, it finally comes with with due time. So can, um, I, can I jump in real quick? Please do. So one of the things that that, that is the hallmark of, of us, and I, this is it is crazy to sit up here with a bunch of guys that got in almost at the same time. We have a mantra at the brewery that is is that we're in the business of staying in business, and I think that that makes a lot of sense for us because we're not what do you call it youthful exuberance, Greg? Is that what you call it? Oh uh, well, it wasn't my term, but irrational irrational exuberance, exuberance yeah. which is there's a lot of that going on right now. A lot of people getting into this business who are putting a lot of money up, and it may not line up, and it may not be part of the good business sense. None of us sitting up here are an overnight success, um, and that's a pretty strong point. That is is that if you're going to be in this business, you're not going to be successful in three years' time, and if you are you might be riding the coattails of some wrong loan, something that doesn't line up. There's a business that gets behind it. You can get into the business, which is great, and you can get into the business and make $8 an hour, and you can make $22 an hour, but it's still a business. And so if you go from graduating from your homebrew in your garage and you want to do this, then you have to prove that your model works. And there's a lot of people right now getting into this because of the lifestyle doctor, uh, that, that really are proving that lifestyle is where it's at. Again, we're in the middle of this really weird time in life and place where money and, and people losing jobs. And so, Hey, I want to go do something that's really cool. Therefore I'm going to go make beer cause beer is cool. And I like beer, but it doesn't mean that they actually have a provable model and that they're going to be successful. There is a business under, underpinning that, you know, that does, that does run the, our day to day operations beyond making great liquid. Greg, what do you see for people moving up? What, what advice do you give for people? They're already in the industry, but what do they have to do to move up? Again, that's the, you know, the day in, day out, uh, consistent, one foot in front of the other, no mystery to it, approach. And it, that, that's just how, it's how you succeed in life, frankly. You, you can luck in, you know, you can win the lottery sometimes or hit the jackpot, but to, to approach life from the perspective of trying to do that rather than trying to, you know, that's, that's how you really do it. And, you know, I think living in San Diego, I can use an easy analogy of the eucalyptus tree. Um, the eucalyptus trees are, they're, in, they're a beautiful tree, part of our, our culture now, even though they're from Australia. But they, um, they're also a public hazard. They grow so fast, their, their limb structure uh, won't uh, support themselves. Uh, and when the Santa Ana's kick up, uh, a lot of times uh, limbs come down with some level of uh, catastrophe. And that's what I'm a little concerned about today is that there, there's no headwind. When we started up, there was a lot of headwind. Uh, we had to really work hard. Uh, the, the marketplace wasn't interested in us. The resources were, weren't all there for us, although there were many more than the early pioneers of the 1980s. Uh, and 
And, but I'm a little concerned that we're going to grow up so fast that we'll actually, we, we've got strong roots. So our roots in the craft brewing industry are very strong. I do not fear for them. The trunk is very strong. I do not fear for it. Most of the limbs are very solid. And I think I'd like to think that we represent, you know, that up here. But um, I am a little cautionary that once the winds kick up, because they always kick up every, you know, fall. The, the, in some years, they're, you know, stronger than others. Um, I fear for some of the limbs coming down and uh, not only, uh, you know, hurting themselves, but uh, taking some collateral damage on the way. So we just got to be cautious of this reality. No, I'm not saying we should go out and prune. Um, <laughs> okay, that's nice. not really our job to make that call, right? Uh, but uh, so let, let's... Uh, you know, in some ways, you, you, you hold back your growth to make sure that it is, you're, you're getting the proper stru structural strength along with the growth so that you can maintain that over a long period of time. And I, I think I could add something to that is that do your due di diligence. You know, don't just wildly go into a field, uh, choose your name, and, and all of a sudden realize that, hey, there's four other breweries with that same name and, and then get mad about it. You know, oh God, I'm going to have to change my pint glasses now because so-and-so has the name that I already took. There's a thing called Google. Yeah. You type <laughs> that name in there, you don't even have to pay a lawyer. It'll come up <laughs> if there's something there. And, and that kind of thing is, is happening now these days. I mean, it's happened to, to us even. And, uh, you know, it's l learn from the guys that have gone there before. You know, um, if you... If you put a red triangle on your beer glass, you're probably going to have bass coming down your door, you know, hey, I, with a cease and desist. So it's, uh, it's something to think about when you're getting into these small breweries. You know, there's a lot of beer out there with every name in, under the sun. Um, some of our names, you know, Tongue Buckler, I, you, you know, you think, oh, that's, that's got to be no problem. But, you know, there are problems with almost every name you could think of. Somebody either has it or has an incarnation of it. So definitely, uh, and then, and then to get, you know, upset when it was your responsibility to do that work first, it's, it's kind of one of those things. Yeah. Yeah. Even, okay. even, even with wine and spirits, it's, Sorry, if it can I, be confused with the brand that you're making, uh, you know, it just, if it can be put to your lips, you should consider, the, uh, the name that's out there. Wise counsel indeed. Oh. Okay, let's shift gears here. Uh, we're going to take questions from the audience. So if you wanted to pass up a uh, question that you had and we'll bring it forward. I have a couple here to get us started. Um, the first one is, does the UCSD extension program cater to working adults that want the job of a brewer or a small brewery owner? So I guess that would go to Yusuf. Yeah, I, th I think you can uh, you can cover all the bases. We're trying to appeal to people that are trying to make transitions uh, in careers. We're appealing to people that own a bar that have staff that want to educate those people further so that when they are selling one of the many craft beers available to them, that they can speak about that beer with some intelligence. And, and you know, I, I've, I've been in bar situations where uh, you you ask for a, a certain beer and they don't even know that beer is made in San Diego. So uh, it'll it'll appeal to you know servers, um, bar owners, uh, people making the transition, people trying to start their own breweries. Uh, the initial courses in the summer will be uh, there'll be a basic course with an overview that I'll be doing, and then we'll have wort production classes, uh, some classes on uh, the actual entire process of making beer um, and then as the program develops we'll get into the financial aspects we'll get into you know the f finishing practices filtering so we're going to cover everything that you need to know uh, it kind of scares a lot of people because it's like oh here's how to how to open up a brewery and and we've already like greg said uh, approaching 100 uh, do we really need two or 300 but uh the breweries that are here do need employees as well. So, you know, in, in my respect, it, it, it's going to be good for the whole industry, but I think you could virtually do whatever you want to do with the program, whether it be just come in and casually learn or make a whole career out of it. Okay. And, and do we, do we need uh, another brewery in San Diego? No. Can we use a brewery that's doing something unique, special and better in their own way? 
Hell yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think that the education part, critical importance, but it's, it's part of the toolkit. And uh, what I've seen in entrepreneurs a lot and people that want to get into their own business is that they rely a little bit too much on what they're told and a little bit too little on what they feel and what they really want to do. So if you take that level of education and then you take a hint from what everybody else is doing just because you want to be aware and, hey, you're going to be an enthusiast, right, or you shouldn't get into this at all, so you're going to be aware – but then go off in your own direction, follow your particular character and passion, that's the formula. Because if you get that level of education and then you copy other people, you're not gonna, it's not gonna get you really very far. If you go off your, in your own crazy way without the education, I might actually say you have a better chance, but if you have both, bam, we're gonna welcome you, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna be sitting up here in, in, in not too long. Um, is, and is with the, with the addition of that and the traditional education, which is understanding how to read, read a, you know, a balance sheet and understanding how to fill out forms and, you know, there are lots of forms, uh, <laughs> and so on. Well, speaking of forms, that leads to regulations and laws. We have a question here from an audience member. Are there any changes in laws that uh, you see coming up that'll make it easier or harder to open a brewery? Does anyone want to take that one? Well, I, I can jump in and just say that uh, there's been the what was the name of the movie that came out the that showed the three tier system with beer, wars? Oh, beer wars yeah yeah there was beer wars and and it it a lot of um, the average Joe that went to see that movie were like oh man it's really hard you know you got you got to fight that whole three tier system and we don't here in California that's that's why there are so many breweries here there is no three tier system we can make beer we can sell it directly out of the back door. We can load it up in our van and ship it out. Um, so it, it has enabled breweries to do what they're doing. The other thing that, that is th- the main reason why there are so many small breweries here in San Diego is the taster bars are legal. You can go in, you can taste beer there, you can get a pint, you can get a growler, you can get a keg. Um, that's not the case across the country. So if you go to Nevada, you can't do that. You can't go into a brewery and get a taster. Uh, they have to have designated days where they, you know, surrender their license and then you can come in and you can buy the glass and they'll happen to fill it with beer, you know, but you're paying for the glass, not the beer. So there is, uh, the laws here in, in California specifically are very geared to making a, a, you know, successful brewery. Spirits, on the other hand, are still three tier and there is some uh, fight right now in California to try to, um, eliminate that three-tier system so distillers can sell direct. And the reason I know that is because I am the only distiller in San Diego, not me personally, but Ballast Point. But, uh, and, and we are, are dealing with that right now. We, we distribute our spirits um, through Young's Market, and we can't sell direct. So when you look at Portland, they've got Distillers Row. It's a row of distilleries, and they, you can go in, you can have a drink, you can b- walk out with a bottle of gin, and those distillers are, are bo- yeah. and 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 they're it's a booming industry there, so the dis- distillation market is being stifled, so to speak, in California because of that three tier system, but the breweries really aren't, and that's that's the the whole reason for the boom here. Um, I got to jump in and just say that I um, disagree with Yusef's take on it, but it, from the different side of the same coin, in just. My perspective is that we actually do have, we have a very strong three-tier system in California. However, we're actually not really disagreeing. However, fortunately, the laws in California allow a small brewer to uh, behave in each one of the, uh, to do actually do or, uh, you know, have their business in each of the tiers. So we have a distribution company. We operate under the same laws and regulations as any wholesaler in California. We have a restaurant. We operate under the same laws and regulations that any restaurant has to operate under that serves alcohol in California, and we're a brewer, and, and same for that. So um, I suppose we don't really disagree, but the perspective is that yeah. these three tiers are, are solid, and they're very important to the way that business is done in California. I'm a little bit of a defender of the so-called three-tier system, but I am also an even stronger defender of a small brewery's rights to have access to market. Um, you know, because we don't believe for a second that if you can sell a growler 
uh, to a person from your brewery so they can take it home and enjoy it in a responsible manner that, that dogs and cats are going to suddenly start running wild in the streets. That's just not the case, clearly, because we do it here. But I can tell you, I've, I view a lot of the legislative battles in other states, and that's what some legislators in some states think is exactly what's going to happen. Oh, my God, all hell is going to break <laughs> loose because we're going to allow somebody to behave in a responsible manner. So we actually um, exhibit all of the characteristics of each one of the tiers because we follow each one of those laws. So it's not a dismantling the system, and I think I just wanted to give that clarity because it's a huge controversy out there in uh, state after state after state and with wholesalers, and, and it's an important system. It's an important system, but we follow the same laws as anybody in any one of those tiers. Yeah, the biggest difference is that as a small brewery, you don't have to get a distributor you can distribute yourself whereas in other states you you can't so you're required to 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 have a distributor but stone being a distributor they it's a it's a little bit more convoluted but what we're talking about here a little bit is is almost becoming history because the other states are very active in removing a lot of these uh, laws that prevent small breweries from opening up or selling beer in their tap room. And I think the challenge for California will be to stay as a leader and to stay as one of the states that was most open to small breweries because um, the local communities still can be tough to open a brewery in and there's still a lot of, uh, there's still a lot of legal red tape to go through and that's all fine, but other states are making it easier. If it wasn't for the California's laws to allow small brewers to self-distribute, stone brewing would not exist. I think you would say the same? Exactly. Because I think that's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm being more personal, but okay, yeah. we'll talk later. Um, because, uh, well, like, you know, it, it, uh, nobody wanted to uh, distribute our beers. None of the wholesalers. We asked. None of the wholesalers would distribute our beers, so we wouldn't have been able to get to market. And it was a time when craft brewers, people weren't coming to us like they are today. Uh, so, so there was no demand uh, for us. We had to go out and work and generate that demand. Um, so it's a, that's why California is, has such a vibrant brewing community. My two-second rebuttal. Sure. This is one of the most regulated industries you can be in. And it is difficult because you can open your doors today and you can abide by the rules today and they'll change them tomorrow. So the concern is, is that they take away our tasting room ability, that they take away Greg's ability to have a distribution company. It, you just can't project what that's going to be. And so we, we go through every day and hope and pray that nothing changes. But every day it's a whim because it's an alcohol-based business. And there's pressures externally being put on our business that we can't control. So the only thing we can do is band together and say, yep, best case practices to what Greg was saying. We in San Diego believe this is a very strong community. If we all work together, we can, you know, we can be tighter. We can be more cohesive. And when that pressure comes, we can push back. Okay. Let's look at another industry, the wine industry. Why? Is this an adversarial? Uh, because one of our audience members wants to know. Uh, they want to know if there's any movement uh, for cross-promotion, or is it just it's uh, dogs and cats, don't invite them together. What, what is the uh, state of the affairs? Well, I, I, for, for a number of years, I've engaged in a friendly rivalry of uh, beer versus wine uh, dinners. And we actually started this oh, maybe eight years ago um, at the Rancho Bernardo Inn's um, El Biscocho. It's now changed, but it's a, f- a very chef-driven, high-end, fine-dining restaurant, which is wine-centric with an amazing wine cellar. And we went in there with the, the simple concept. Chef was going to prepare uh, seven courses uh, and a sommelier paired a wine to go with each course, and we chose a beer to go with each course. And all of the people in the, uh, the, in the dining room that evening had a little respondent card, and it was course by course, and they checkboxed whether they thought that the wine pairing was a little bit better or the beer pairing was a little bit better. Well, it's probably not a big mystery why I'm telling you this story. <laughs> <laughs> Because in a wine-centric, we went into the, you know, lion's den. In a wine-centric world, beer won. And, and the reason is because beer is truly a, a more complex and, and, uh, and a better, it, it's just really, it's, frankly, it's easy to pair beer and, and great beer and great food. Your wins are going to be far more than your, your losses. When it comes to pairing great wine with great food, it can be a challenge to do it correctly. Uh, and you can have w- wonderful wins in both worlds, 
Well, beer just has an advantage in that. And uh, and so I, I think we've all been working to fight for uh, craft beer's rightful place at the dinner table. And there has been a little bit of that, um, you know, feeling like we're, in, you know, uh, the underdog and we have to fight a little bit harder. And I've been a little bit scrappy about it over the years. But the truth is, great wine and great beer, we're a, we're, it's a camaraderie. And, and, uh, and cheap wine and cheap beer... I don't think there's any camaraderie, but they're still together in the same pool as far as I'm concerned. Um, and none of them are in my house. Yeah, it's, um, I, we, I think any of us at the table love to drink wine, and there's a place for it. 90% of the wine in the world is made by two people, and a lot of that sort of correlates to beer as well. You know, 90% of the beer is made by two big companies. The problem with wine and food is that wine builds check averages, and check averages are great for restaurants because they can make a lot of money not, not doing much. And that is the uphill battle that Greg references, and, and it's true. So we're fighting that, but there is a lot of opportunity for beer, but we don't bring $70, $100, $200 bottles to the table. Therefore, we don't bring check average. So they're not going to clear the wine list in favor of the beer list. Although the ability to do both is what we're really selling these days, which is you're going to have someone who's going to open with a $30 bottle of beer and move to the $100 bottle of wine. Yeah, you might not sell the $30 bottle of wine and move up to the $100 bottle, but you're going to get both points anyways. So I, I believe there's a room for both. I don't think we're fighting a fight that isn't, you know, we want to be at the table because the table, you know, we deserve to be at the table. Um, but we've got to we've got to show that our place is there and and we can drive that price point that, that matters to them. If you're at a fine dining restaurant with uh, clients or guests and you buy a, an extraordinarily expensive bottle of wine, you impress them with your spending power. If you choose a really amazing bottle of craft beer, you choose them with your, you exp um, impress them with your good taste. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the beer that we're making now, and, uh, you know, Colby at our facility is a shining example of this, but he studies the, the food that, that, and then he makes beers that, go along with that food and and i i haven't had a wine that's been infused with uh habanero before i haven't had a wine that's had uh vanilla and coffee and uh thai chili pepper and you know th these are all flavors that we put in the beer so when you're pairing this beer that has all these other flavors in it it just naturally goes with uh food uh one of my favorite quotes from colby uh for our uh indra canindra which is a a curry based uh, uh, foreign style stout is the best thing to pair it with is white rice because it just it's got so much flavor in it and uh, th that's the way things are going now with beer is that uh, you know the chefs are actually getting with the brewers and I don't think that goes along with the vintners I, I there's a different mentality the, the, the cook you know there's it's almost a sense of uh, being humble, you know, you, you go into the chef and you say, Hey, I'm, I'm good at making beer. You're good at making food. Let's, let's work together and make something exceptional. And, uh, it doesn't have to be, you know, a, a scallop wrapped in bacon with a foie gras demi glaze, you know, it can be pulled pork and we can throw, you know, a nice amber ale with that. And, uh, you know, beer is still every person's drink and, uh, I don't want it to to not be that way. I, I don't want it to elevate to the level of wine. It, it doesn't need to be. It still needs to be the drink of the people. And uh, and wine kind of lost that. And hopefully beer doesn't. Uh, and even though we can make all these extravagant beers, they're still pretty reasonable priced and, and it's available to most people. And, and that's kind of kind of one up for beer, I think. <laughs> well, let's uh, go on to... Um Career opportunities. We'll get back to that. The career opportunities that people miss. Um, is there anything that we haven't covered that uh, people should be thinking about? Well, uh, we're hiring for the Stone Brewing World Bistro and Gardens Liberty Station right now. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, about uh, we have over 200 positions opening. So if you're uh, if you know somebody, then it's mostly on the restaurant side of the equation. Um, but uh, yeah. And we just had actually for somebody, for example, we had somebody uh, who had been working with us in our kitchen uh, as a dishwasher for um, quite some time and just moved over to the bottling line. And I ran into him yesterday and he's so excited about it. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, you have that, that, that latitudinal uh, ability. But um, what do you think is m missing? Or the, the career opportunity that we haven't talked about yet. 
it's an oyster. I mean, it's there's so much opportunity right now. You 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 can if you're passionate about beer, you can go to someone like Stone that has all these different job openings. You can go to the guy that opened up around the corner from you, and it it is. It's it's pretty amazing how many job openings there are. We've hired people throughout the years. I think when we opened our doors, there were three of us. We have 40 people that work for us now, um, all the way from a tasting room environment up to production. It's pretty much, you know, if you're passionate and you can convince somebody to give you a shot and you're worth a damn, you're going to get hired. Um, and at the same time, if you're not and you're superficial and you just think that this is a cool industry, you're, you're not going to pass the litmus test. Yeah, I think there's jobs that people don't even consider as part of the brewing world. I mean, we're looking for a 18 wheeler truck driver right now, you know, and, and, you know, stuff like that where people don't even realize, Hey, wow, that that's a brewing position. So there's, there's not only these, these kind of jobs that you, that you wouldn't consider, but there, people should also be looking into what do we need? What, what kind of resources do we use and what new ways could, could I maybe make even more money than these brewers do by taking their spent grain and compressing it into a log that burns in a fireplace or so, you know, some, some bizarre use of, of what we tend to discard, you know, our, our spent yeast. Can we ship it to Australia and make Vegemite out of it? You know, what, what can we do with our raw materials other than feed it to cows, you know, like we, we do now. And even that, you know, we've got a farmer that comes multiple times a day and, and takes our spent grain to feed cows. You know, is there a way to store it and sell it to that farmer instead of just giving it to them. So there's lots of little jobs that could could go even beyond the realm of what we think on a day-to-day level of brewing. When's somebody going to make San Diego's uh, answer to Vegemite? Uh, doctor, I think that's a seg to you. Well, if people would eat it. <laughs> yeah. It's because we, we have a lot of extra yeast. Ch- chicken or egg. I mean, you got to yes. make it before yeah. people are going to eat it. Well, I have thought of it, yeah. I mean, we all we thought, thought of a lot of these ideas, and uh, and maybe some of these ideas will come to fruition. And in thinking about what employment opportunities are out there, too, there are so many other positions that aren't the brewer, but if you have brewer experience or education, you're likely to get some of these jobs. You know, if you want to be a controller, uh, if you have a brewery experience or you've got some brewery education behind you, some classes, you're likely to get hired by the brewery that's whole, that's hiring uh, for a controller because there's not too many out there that have brewing experience. So even starting into brewing or education might help you get some of these other jobs that are becoming available. If, yeah. if you, we have an accounting position and you kind of don't really care that much about what we do, but you're amazing at, for, at your job skills, we're not going to hire you. If you're pretty damn good, but maybe not quite yet amazing at your job skills, but you care passionately about what we're about, you're our person. Okay. Well, you've given a lot of great advice today. I'd like to go down the line and ask, what's the best career advice that you've ever received? Tommy, could we start off with you? Just that simple. That simple? Yeah. Yeah. Um, work harder than the guy next to you. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Down? Yeah. Yep. Oh, that was mine. You stole it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Basically, go above and beyond. Uh, do more, more than... Ex- than it's expected of you, as Greg was saying, that goes right along with what Tommy said. But basically, when I started out, I was a clerk in a homebrew shop, and I did uh, the mail order catalog. I did newsletters. I tried tried to do stuff that wasn't asked of me. And uh, when you start doing things and your boss notices, um, it doesn't even necessarily have to compliment you on those, but if if you, if you make yourself valuable... Um, I know how to weld. I know how to do some electrical repair. I can plumb. I'm not just a brewer. And being a renaissance person in your industry makes you more valuable and harder to get rid of. So learn learn as much as you can. Okay. Greg? Best advice. Um, uh, you can't do it. Nobody wants it, and you're nuts. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. That just gives you power. I mean, that just, there you go. Anybody that says that, that means huge opportunity. Okay. And Chris? Well, I guess it's similar to what people said up here. Um, I, one of the best pieces of advice I got when I was young, my dad said, be the hardest working person in the group. And uh, I also saw that by example. 
And so that's what I've tried to do. And, and it comes back again and again. And this probably in every industry, you're going to rise above. Uh, and you pair that with some education and some, um, and some other skills. And as you said, said, you're hard to get rid of. Okay. You know, let me, let me get back. Just, just Chris brought up a, reminded me something of when we were homebrewing uh, 20 or so years ago. We were making a German-style wheat beer, and I was cooking on the stove doing this temperature hold decoction. And he goes, have you done this before this way? And I go, no, it, you know, I usually just do a single temperature mash. And he goes, well, how do you know it won't work with this? And I'm like, well, that's what I've always been told. You got to do the step mash and everything. He goes, well, how do you know if you don't try? And all of a sudden, Descartes came in, my UCSD philosophy degree, you know, <laughs> blank slate. Okay, you're right. I don't know that this won't work. Cranked up the heat, threw in the malt, and made one of the best wheat beers I've ever made. So don't just go by, you know, what you've read from a brewing book that's 40 years old. You know, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of stuff, and, and we're mavericks, we're stupid, and that's why we, we make the beer we make. And uh, if we made the beers the Germans told us to make, we'd be drinking four different styles of beer. They'd be damn good, yeah. but there'd be only four styles of beer, roughly. Mm -hmm. um, and I love German beer, not to say anything bad about it, but you know, they, there's, there's laws that say they can't do what we do over here. And uh, because we are the mavericks that we are in the brewing industry, it's why all of us are successful. I was just at a, a brewing a conference and a show in Munich uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, honestly, they treated me like I was a, a rock star. They are so jealous of our industry in, in the United States. It, it they could say, be the beard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All, although that's a reason of its own. Okay. That's okay. not why. Okay. Um, <laughs> you know, they're, they, they know that they're constrained by tradition, and it's amazing. There are a couple of years ago in Germany, uh, there were maybe somewhere between zero and two um, American-style IPAs being brewed. Today, um, uh, there's well over several dozen American-style IPAs being brewed in Germany. It's, it is amazing, the explosion of what is happening over in Europe. And I was just in Brazil, same thing, that are looking to the United States. When do you work? Finding incredible inspiration. <laughs> that is my work, brother. <laughs> I'm spreading the message. <laughs> Hence the beard. Yeah. <laughs> it could be the craft beer talking. Uh, is that craft beard? Uh, <laughs> oh, that's the first time you said <laughs> I just lost mine today, actually. Oh. Welcome to Brewer Comedy Hour, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you so much for the panel. Uh, why don't we have a round of applause for our panelists? Uh, here we go.